So I've noticed recently that there's a lot of law enforcement officers and first responders that are carrying decompression needles in their first aid kits and really only have a vague understanding of how to use them. In today's video, I want to go through the signs and symptoms of a tension pneumothorax and how to do a successful needle decompression in the field. So before we get started with the video, a quick disclaimer, this is for informational purposes only. Um, always fall back on your own protocols and procedures and make sure you're not doing this procedure unless you're officially trained in it. This should only be done by advanced providers um, in very specific settings. So this is some good information to have, but ultimately only do this if you're officially trained to do it. And no, this video does not technically count. So to start off with, before we can talk about a needle decompression, we have to talk about what a tension pneumothorax is. Essentially, a tension pneumothorax is when someone's lungs, lung collapses and the pressure builds up in between the lung and the thoracic wall. That will slowly compress the lung over, further deflating the lung, and eventually interfering with vital organs in what's called the mediastinum. Those are the heart and several arteries in the center of someone's chest. If the pressure in the tension pneumothorax gets too great, it will actually cause what's called obstructive shock and will eventually kill the person. Tension pneumothorax is one of the leading causes of preventable combat casualties. So a tension pneumothorax can develop in several ways. Um, the first most common way is going to be penetrating trauma. So that's a gunshot wound or a knife wound or shrapnel to the chest that causes that lung to collapse in the first place. Now generally we treat a sucking chest wound by putting a uh, occlusive dressing over it and that can sometimes even cause the tension pneumothorax. The second cause of a tension pneumothorax, which is a little bit less likely, is going to be blunt force trauma. So that's your explosions, fall from a helicopter, fall from a vehicle, or just get hit by something. And that can cause the lung to rupture internally and that pressure can start building up. So your indications for a needle decompression are going to vary a little bit, uh, whether you're in the civilian side or the combat side, so your military and law enforcement. On the civilian side, um, you're going to look for uh, lung sounds that are absent on one side of the chest. You're going to look for hyperresonance in the chest, so it feels like it's almost like a drum and it's really, really tight because there's a lot of pressure. Um, you're going to be looking for tracheal deviation, which is a very late sign, and then potentially uh, abnormal chest movement. So one side might go up and down, but since the other side isn't inflating or deflating, it's just going to stay stationary. Now, in the military and law enforcement side, if you're in a combat scenario, you're essentially going to be looking for chest trauma or suspected chest trauma um, with difficulty breathing and shortness of breath. Depending on your role, these signs are going to lead you to do a needle decompression of the chest. So let's go over to the bench and I'll show you some of the sites that are used for decompression as well as talk you through some of your equipment selection for this particular task. All right, so there are a couple different devices that can be used to do a needle decompression um, in the field. So kind of the old school method is just a regular IV catheter, 14 gauge. Um, this has been used for a long time. However, recent studies have shown that uh, these catheter lengths are not long enough uh, to get to the thoracic cavity in a large percentage of adult uh, patients. So the current recommendation now is to go to at least a 3.25 inch catheter, if not four inch. This is a commercial device. This is an ARS needle from North American Rescue. And like I just said, it's a 3.25 inch uh, catheter. This one, because this is a piece of expired equipment we have, this is only the 14 gauge model. But now they have a 10 gauge model, which has been shown to be even more effective just because it's a larger bore. I don't really care what brand you use, but I would recommend using a commercial device that is at least, uh, it meets that uh, length requirement. So you have a couple different sites you can use for a needle decompression. The primary site that a lot of EMS personnel are going to use is going to be your anterior site at the second intercostal space, uh, just above the third rib at the midclavicular line. Now that's kind of a mouthful, but we'll kind of talk through that when I go through how to actually insert it. This is the most common site and it's really easy to find. It's easy to palpate your landmarks and insert. The disadvantage of this is, is that it's very close to the cardiac box. So it's very close to your heart. 
Um, and if you get too close to that, you stab the heart, obviously there's gonna be some problems there. There are also uh, some arteries and veins that run in there that if you were to puncture, you'd cause a hemothorax, which is the same as a tension pneumothorax, except that instead of air, it's blood filling up the chest cavity. And a needle uh, decompression isn't going to do what you need it to do in that case. So there is a risk to this site. Now your other sites are going to be at the mid-axillary line, so that's kind of dividing the body this way, and that's going to be your third and fourth intercostal space. Uh, this is the traditional site for a chest tube. It works very well for decompressions as well. The advantage of it is if you have somebody that's in full body armor, um, so a police officer, soldier, and you're still in a hostile environment, the last thing you want to do is take their armor off. Now in these patients, in somebody in body armor, this part of their body right under their armpit is not protected by armor. So you can just raise their arm, do the decompression, and keep them protected the entire time. Pretty big advantage. Now the disadvantage is, is that it's a lot harder to palpate your landmarks there. I can count the ribs down up here, come over, and I've got it. But you're not going to be able to count ribs where the arm is. So it does take a little bit more effort to find that site. And then your third site, less commonly used, and I'm not really going to go in depth um, on it, partially because I'm not incredibly familiar with it, but you can go to the fifth intercostal space at the anterior axillary line. So that's kind of right in here. And uh, this is an acceptable site to use if you'd like to. Um, as far as I know, I don't think there's any advantages to this site over third or fourth, um, but it is an option for you. And I'm a big proponent of having a lot of tools in your toolbox. So this is just another one for you. So let's go over the actual, actual insertion of the needle. So to find your site, we're going to do the anterior site, and then I'll kind of explain these ones here. So to find your anterior site, you're going to start by palpating down. Now it's easiest to palpate ribs close to the sternum where they meet the sternum because you have a lot less uh, adipose tissue and muscle mass here. So your first rib is going to be very hard to palpate because it rests kind of under your clavicle. So you might only be able to feel the first intercostal space. But you're going to find that space, find that second rib, and then find your second intercostal space. But then because we don't want to be too close to that second rib because you have some vasculature that runs underneath ribs, we're going to come down to the third rib and just come up just a little bit into that second intercostal space. So right above the third rib. Now we're going to draw a line. We're going to keep palpating that rib all the way over to the midclavicular line. We want to make sure that we are not too medial because um, we could hit that heart like I was talking about before. So we generally want to be uh, lateral to the nipple line here and keep that pretty far out. Now obviously that's going to change depending on anatomy, but we do want to make sure that we're not too close there. So once we've identified the site, we're going to take our needle and then we're going to hold that perpendicular to the chest. We don't want to angle it in towards the heart at all. We want to go straight down and we're going to bury that needle all the way down to the hub. Now we're going to wait for five seconds and we're going to kind of listen for a rush of air. A lot of times you're not going to hear that rush of air because you're in a loud environment, especially if you're in a combat situation doing this, you're just not going to hear it. So you'll wait five seconds because right now this has a metal rigid catheter running down the plastic catheter and that holds it open just in case the musculature were to constrict the plastic catheter. So it gives the lung time to inflate. Once you wait those five seconds, you're going to remove the needle dispose of that in a safe manner, obviously. And then we're gonna reassess our patient. So while you might not hear a rush of air, you're gonna to wanna to listen to lung sounds if you have time to do it, If obviously if you're not in a combat situation. Um, and you're basically gonna look for the reversal of all the signs that caused you to do this in the first place. So increase in mental status, decrease in difficulty breathing, uh, better lung sounds on both sides, increase of O2 saturations and whatnot. Now, your second sites are found about the same way. What you can do for these is you can come down and you can actually palpate here. And I can say, all right, so I've got to the third rib. So I want that third intercostal space, so right underneath that third rib. And then you can kind of try to palpate over. It'll be easier on some people, harder on others and come down to the mid axillary line. And the insertion is essentially the same. You just hold perpendicular to your site and push all the way to the hub, wait five seconds, then remove the needle. And you're still uh, listening for that whoosh of air uh, coming out of it. 
So the insertion is essentially the same. And if you're one off, granted you have the leeway of third or fourth intercostal space, uh, that's going to be okay. So you don't have to be too hung up on the site, although I do advise being as accurate as possible at all times. Some of the old literature said that when you put this on, you had to do like a one-way valve, you know, push this through the finger of your glove and then it wouldn't let air back in. They've really found in recent studies that this is not a necessary step to take because the diameter of this needle is too small to allow any air to come back in. And if air does come back in, it's a very small amount and it doesn't cause any clinical uh, changes. So you do not have to do a one-way valve on here anymore. So I hope this video uh, makes you a little bit more comfortable with your decompression needles in your kit. If you have any questions about what we did today, uh, please leave it in the comments down below. Be sure you like and subscribe to my channel, and I will see you next time.